There are a lot of shocking crimes out there, but this one in particular has to do with one of the most shocking and unsuspecting victims, a nun. Sister Kathy was a 26-year-old Catholic nun and teacher living in Baltimore. After going out to run some errands, Kathy was faced by a terrifying scenario, her own termination. Catherine, or Kathy Sesnick, was born in Pennsylvania in 1942. She grew up with both parents and was the oldest of four kids. She went to a Catholic school where she was the student council president, senior class president, and valedictorian. Dang, she is not messing around. Get it, girl. Kathy went on to become a nun and got a job teaching English and theater at Archbishop Keough High School, an all-girls private Catholic school in Baltimore. Everyone at that school said she was the real-life version of Maria from The Sound of Music. Wait, I love that. Kathy is definitely giving me Maria vibes for sure. Just gotta start spinning to music on a grassy hill and voila. Kathy recently took a sabbatical from that school and took on another job teaching at another high school in Baltimore, which is where her career abruptly ended. On the night of November 7th, 1969, Kathy was last seen leaving her apartment to go run some errands. She took off sometime between 7 and 7.30 and was set out to stop by the bank, a bakery, and a department store to buy an engagement present for her sister. Wait, what bank is open at 7 p.m.? And why would she go to a bakery at the end of the day when the bread is all stale? Everyone knows to go early in the morning to get that good good. Anyway, Kathy's roommate, who was also a Catholic nun, got a bit worried when it started to get late and Kathy had yet to come home. Her roomie then reached out to two priest friends and asked them to come and help her look for Kathy. They were unsuccessful in finding Kathy, but they did discover her green Ford Maverick that night, or I guess the next morning because it was like 4 a.m. Kathy's car was parked illegally right across the street from her apartment, you know, where she literally had a reserved parking space. It was also coated in mud, which is sus because her car didn't have any mud on it the day before. The three searchers went up to Kathy's car and noticed it had been unlocked, but she wasn't inside. That's not a good sign, unless she had enough of the nun life and made a run for it. So the three searchers looked through Kathy's car for any clues that might hint at her whereabouts. In the car, they found a box of rolls from the bakery, a few fibers, and leaves and twigs that were on the front seat. Okay, so maybe Kathy went to the bakery for some noms and then decided to take a solo off-roading trip through the mud. But then I'm not sure where she would go after that. Well, since Kathy's friends couldn't find her anywhere, they decided to call the cops. The police arrived at her apartment and began an investigation. Officers rolled up with canine units and searched the whole neighborhood. They knocked on doors, went through alleyways, and looked in abandoned buildings in the area. But Kathy was still nowhere to be found, and there weren't any witnesses who saw what happened to her. The only information they gathered from Kathy's neighbors is that they noticed her pull back up to her apartment at 8.30 p.m., and two hours later, her car was parked across the street. So whatever happened, it happened quick. The police didn't notice any signs of foul play, so they just thought Kathy must have run away at this point. But less than a week after Kathy disappeared, another woman went missing. Oh, this is getting interesting. It was a 20-year-old woman named Joyce. She was last seen on November 11th, and on the 12th, officials found her car without her in it. Okay, something shady is definitely going on here, and those two instances have to be connected. That can't be a coincidence. So Joyce's car was found parked in an abandoned gas station with the keys still in the ignition. In the car, officials found Joyce's glasses and some groceries she had purchased the day before. One day later, Joyce's lifeless body was found floating in a river by two hunters. She was covered in puncture wounds and her hands were tied with a cord. There was also a pair of black high heels found in the water at Joyce's dumping grounds. And the night of Kathy's disappearance, she was last seen wearing black shoes. So maybe the two women share the same abductor and these shoes are Kathy's. Well, investigators said they would check out the possible connection with the shoes at the crime scene, but I guess they didn't put that at the top of their to-do list because nothing happened in Kathy's case until two months later. On January 3rd, a father and son were on a walk in an area near a dumping ground where they came across a set of remains. And I'm sure you've already put two and two together, but the remains were Kathy's. So the dude who found her called the police and they came out to investigate the scene. Kathy's corpse was covered in snow and hidden behind an embankment. There was a cigarette butt nearby that would later be tested for DNA. Based on the location of her body, police believed Kathy had to be carried or forced to walk to that location because a car could not have been driven from the main road to where the body was found. From all of the information they had, detectives believed Kathy came back from running errands, was snatched up right outside her apartment, forced back into her car, and driven to the dumping grounds where she was assaulted and slain. Wow, that's pretty brutal. And I can't believe no one saw her get snatched up if it was right outside of her place. Like, wouldn't someone have heard her screaming or something? 
Then again, she was probably forced by the perp to stay silent. So whatever happened, it was super creepy and mysterious. After the crime scene was investigated, Kathy's body was then taken for an autopsy. Medical examiners discovered two big fractures on her head and determined those blows are what knocked her out. But Kathy's body was too decomposed for examiners to tell anything else about the incident. And another interesting thing about Kathy's discovery is it happened in the middle of a huge strike by workers of three main newspaper companies. So her story was barely covered in the media at all. Based on the lack of coverage, no one really knows anything else about what happened to Kathy and why. Wait, that's crazy. I can't believe this wasn't talked about more. I feel like a nun going missing and being found in such a brutal state is pretty newsworthy. From 1970 to 1977, detectives continued to actively investigate the case. They brought in witnesses for interviews and polygraph tests and sifted through the little evidence they had. One of the biggest mysteries about Kathy's case is whether or not she was physically violated. Due to the state of her corpse when it was found, examiners couldn't tell if Kathy was assaulted in that way. And most people believe that if that could have been determined, her case would be solved today. This is primarily because there was a man in Kathy's life that was very predatorial towards her. And get this, the suspicious guy was actually a priest named Joseph. A priest was stalking her. That's new. So this whole allegation about Joseph going after Kathy didn't come about until 1992, when two former students from Archbishop Keough High School came forward about being abused by this man. After those claims, Joseph was fired from the school and sent to a psychiatric hospital, but he returned in 1993 after he was determined to have no mental abnormalities. And once he came back, he was actually hired as a pastor at a Catholic church in the area. Uh, I don't know much about the pastor hiring process, but I feel like it should be much stricter if the guy was literally accused of violating two girls. Like, did they even run a background check on this dude? So after the former students made those accusations against Joseph, they tried to file a lawsuit against him. One of the girls actually told officials that after Joseph abused her, he took her to see Kathy's body a few weeks before it was discovered. She even mentioned seeing maggots on Kathy's face. Well, that's one way to lose your appetite in the matter of seconds. So this girl also claimed that she met another man in Joseph's office who told her he beat Kathy because she found out about him crossing boundaries with students. Oh, okay, that kind of makes sense because I can't come up with any other reason why someone would want to brutally whack a nun out of the blue like that. In this case, it had been over 20 years since these victims were abused, so they weren't allowed to go through with their lawsuit. Yo, this is making me so mad. It was probably hard enough for these women to come forward about their abuse, and now they're being punished for not speaking up immediately, even though their lives are being threatened by those men? Hmm, looks like the court system needs to revisit some of their rules. Okay, so around the same time those two girls ratted Joseph out, there was another person who came forward with a crazy story about the priest. A guy named William, who worked with Joseph at a local church, once said he made him dig a hole in the cemetery to bury boxes of records. William said he peeked in one of the boxes when no one was looking and saw various pieces of paperwork, old checks, and inappropriate photos of children. Despite his concerning discovery, William continued to bury the boxes without asking any questions. After that, he drew a map of where the boxes were buried and put it in a safe until he was ready to come forward. In 1994, William finally mustered the courage to rat the priest out. Shortly after that, the mysterious boxes were exhumed. Investigators didn't find any of the photos William was talking about, they only found paperwork. But that doesn't mean someone could have dug up the boxes between the time they were buried and exhumed to take the photos out. And despite all of the dirt people had on Joseph, he was never considered a main suspect in Kathy's case. But officials did say they interviewed him at length. What in the actual fuck? Why did detectives not pin Joseph as a suspect? They didn't really have anyone else on their list of possible perps, so they definitely could have taken the time to take those girls' allegations a little bit more seriously and vet the guy. Well, Joseph passed away a free man in 2001, and we still never know if he was the one responsible for Kathy's big farewell. From the mid-90s to the early 2000s, DNA profiles from about six suspects were tested against the sample found on the cigarette butt at the crime scene. None of them were a match. Nothing else happened in Kathy's case until May of 2016 when the Catholic Church posted a list of priests that had been accused of abuse. And to no one's surprise, Joseph was on the list. The church also admitted to paying a bunch of settlements to Joseph's victims to keep them quiet. Since 2011, they've apparently paid over $400,000 to 16 victims, but still, Joseph was never criminally charged. Oh, and his brother was a Baltimore police officer, so that may be one of the reasons he was never really looked at as a suspect. In fact, Joseph's brother let him attend ride-alongs, and the dude apparently had his own police scanner and would sometimes drive to the scene of the crimes when calls were made, 
even though he wasn't a cop and had no reason nosing in other people's business. He was also known for being obsessed with firearms. Can you say control freak? I bet Joseph was also salty he chose to pursue a career as a priest instead of becoming a cop because he clearly loved surrounding himself in crime. You know, if this whole true crime cooking show hosting thing doesn't work out for me, I think I'm gonna become a florist. You're surrounded by pretty flowers, good smells, and your job is to make people's day and men relationships. That's pretty cool. Where was I? Oh yeah, Joseph's creepy MO. Officials finally exhumed Joseph's body to obtain a DNA sample. They tested it against the sample found at the scene and it was not a match. But how did they even know the cigarette had anything to do with Kathy's attack? And why did it take them so long to get Joseph's DNA? Officials mentioned the negative results don't necessarily clear Joseph, it just means the current forensic technology can't prove a physical link between him and the crime scene. Wait, so is it a match or not? Because I'm confused. Like, let me know if that was his DNA or not. It's a yes or no question. So here are the most recent updates in Kathy's case. In the summer of 2017, Archbishop Keogh High School suddenly closed. And no one really knows why, but all I'm saying is they closed right after the church acknowledged Joseph's allegations. So maybe they didn't want to deal with the aftermath and just called it quits. That same year, a woman came forward claiming she had been physically violated by a now departed Baltimore police officer who was linked to Kathy and Joseph. She declined to be interviewed and requested to remain anonymous. And I don't really blame her. I mean, based on the way other women were treated for their claims, this girl was probably scared out of her mind that she'd be shut down the same way. The Baltimore County Police Department's cold case detectives continue to look for clues in Kathy's case that may lead to more answers. But after all these years, investigators have yet to find the perp who terminated Sister Kathy. There are a bunch of Facebook groups and pages dedicated to seeking justice for Kathy as well as the other woman, Joyce. Even today, a volunteer organization is offering a reward to anyone who can provide information about Kathy's case that leads to an arrest in connection with the unsolved felony offenses. If you have any tips about Kathy's disappearance and passing, call the Metro Crime Stoppers to submit an anonymous tip. Kathy's story is downright awful, and it's so sad that justice still has not been served after over 50 years. And I still can't get over the fact that someone targeted a nun. Well, if there's anything we can take away from Kathy's case, it's to always look out for the people around you and speak up when something isn't right. And I think that's enough crime for today because it's Chirona time. Thanks for watching.